Last week we began looking at this doctrine of saints only. Uh, I mentioned a couple, a few years back, um, began preparing for debate on the subject with some who hold this view. And then a few weeks ago, uh, someone, not here, but in another part of the country, uh, called me and asked me about some specific points on this subject. So I thought I would compile all the material, which is not as easy as it seems, uh, into a, not a sermon, but a series of sermons dealing with this. <laughs> These brethren believe that we can only help out of the church treasury in a benevolent way those who are Christians. They believe that if a congregation helps a non-Christian, someone who is not a saint, out of the church treasury, they sin. And those congregations who do so, those congregations that teach the acceptability of doing so, that they are hell-bound. Now then, that many times is not the way they like to put it, but that is their position. We looked at a few quotes, and basically a couple of actual propositions that people affirmed in debates. Earl Bingham, in his debate with Alan Hires, affirmed the Scriptures teach that in benevolence, churches of Christ may relieve saints only. Now that is a, the basic premise. What he doesn't add in the proposition is that thus it is sinful if you help someone who is not a saint. You cannot, or churches out of the treasury, cannot help those who are not saints. If you do it, then you, it's committing sin and thus hell bound, which is more what A.C. Grider affirmed in his debate with uh, Brother W.L. Toddy, when he affirmed the Bible teaches that it is a sin for the church to take money from the church treasury to buy food or need, for needy, destitute children, and those who do so will go to hell. Now then, whether you substitute for that and uh, the idea of needy, destitute children and just put needy, non-saints. Uh, the point is, though, that uh, this really draws out the heinousness of this doctrine that you cannot, out of the church treasury, help even a needy child. Uh, and if you do it, then you're going to go to hell. We looked at their primary arguments, basically twofold, um, yeah. that all of the examples in the New Testament of giving aid is to saints only. Uh, we looked at that rather extensively last week, so I won't go over it again. The other primary argument is the aspect of fellowship, that believers are not to have, and the church cannot have, fellowship with unbelievers, non-saints. The problem with that, of course, and that if you give them money out of the church treasury, then you have the church being in fellowship with the non-believer, the non-saint. The problem with it should be obvious, but uh, apparently isn't to some, that if giving implies fellowship, and if a congregation thus giving to a non-saint implies fellowship with that non-saint, then the individual, the same principle would hold true. If an individual out of, who is a Christian out of his pocket 
gave money to some, help someone who is in need, then that would place that believer in fellowship with a non-saint. Let me in this uh, add the aspect, those who hold a saint's only position, a lot of times they are accused of being stingy and greedy and all of these other things. That's not the case. That's just some false accusations. Many of them are very generous. It is simply they do not believe that you can do it out of the church treasury. So what they do, they do it out of their own pocket. Well, if the aspect of this argument of fellowship is true, then they commit sin in doing that. You can't have it both ways. Uh, let's look at today some of the major passages that are going to be dealt with in this subject. And as I was compiling this material, I'm not exactly sure how far I'll get. I won't get all of the things that I've got prepared because it's too much. But the first passage is 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 13. In fact, we might not even get past this one. <laughs> The saints only, well, the passage states that whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Of course, men there in italics. Those who hold the saints only position take various positions on this. So we'll look at um, about, I think, three different positions. The first is that unto all men has reference to saints. I said if you can't read that, and that's going to be up for a while because I'm going to leave that up as I respond to what the position is. But Bill Reeves wrote the word them, in context, refers to saints in Jerusalem that on occasion were needy. And the word all refers to all saints everywhere on all other such occasion. The next verse makes it crystal, crystal clear that only saints are under consideration. Paul in, and it says verse 1, but... I think it was verse 14 that it was supposed to be. Uh, Paul, in verse 1, telling the Corinthians that the benevolence command was for saints, would not, in verse 13, praise them for dispensing said benevolence to non-saints. Now then, Number one, there is no scripture to prove that the relief for Jerusalem was for anyone else. It is continually stated the money that was being collected was for the poor saints at Jerusalem. Now then, he wants to take this and make it for others. When it says, unto them, it has saints in Jerusalem. When it gets to all, then it refers to saints everywhere. Everywhere else. Where is the justification, though, for it to be applied to anyone other than Jerusalem? But notice what this does to the verse because and we'll see this a little bit more in the next quote <clears throat> that if you substitute the idea of saints for all because that's his position you then have uh, 
for your liberal distribution unto saints in Jerusalem and saints in other locations. Now, when you read it that way, which is what he is arguing, you start saying that that doesn't even make good sense to say that. It just, it just doesn't. One similar to this states that unto all men refers back to unto them. <clears throat> w. L. Horton wrote, All is a st substantive and takes the place of a noun. The identity of the noun it stands for must always be determined by the context. If we say that Jim, Don, and Bill went to town and then say all had a good time, does anyone suppose that we are talking about any others than Jim, Don, and Bill? Whoever is included in the all of St. Corinthians 9.13 will be in the context and not because ace pantos, that's unto them, and it's the Greek phrase, inherently means everybody, whether saint or sinner. The pro one of the problems is that he fails to show any limitation of all in this. He wants to say that, well, it's a substantive, and thus it refers back to saints. And the illustration that he uses is thus, in reality, not parallel to the passage. And even in his illustration, it doesn't prove what he necessarily wants it to prove. Jim, Don, and Bill went to town. Okay, you have that statement. All had a good time. How do you know that all refers to Jim, Don, and Bill? Or if it refers to the entire town? It could be either one. That everyone in town had a good time. Uh, they just, uh, there's no way to determine in that type of a usage of it. If you substitute, again, the noun for the substantive, then it's always going to make sense. In his illustration, giving him the aspect that, let's just say it does refer to Jim, Don, and Bill. Okay? Jim, Don, and Bill went to town. Jim, Don, and Bill had a good time. That makes perfect sense. And that's saying and giving him the argument that all there ha is a substantive that refers to those three individuals. But it is limited by the context of the statement. The all there. The all obviously refers back to those three. There's a limitation there. Substitute again, coming back to St. Corinthians 9.13. For your liberal distribution unto saints and unto saints. Now, does that make sense? If, he would, if Paul were writing that here's your liberal distribution unto saints and unto saints. That doesn't make sense again. It's not parallel to the illustration that he uses. But notice the conjunction there in St. Corinthians 9.13. He doesn't use it in his illustration. But notice the conjunction that 
your liberal distribution unto them and unto all. The word and being a conjunction joins two grammatical elements together. They're not the same thing, though. We know that. We've used that through the years, and every one of you have used the aspect of Mark 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and, there's that conjunction again, and is baptized shall be saved. The, is there anyone, have you ever heard of anyone who said that belief is baptism and baptism is belief? Why? Because the conjunction and is joining two different things together to get the result of shall be saved. We understand that. It is so clear, so plain for each and every one of us. But yet, when we get to this, all of a sudden, in order to escape the difficulty of the word all there, they come up with this idea that all refers back to unto them. And so you would have, using the unto them, your, the liberal distribution unto them and unto them. And since unto them is referring to saints, unto saints and unto saints. Now we're going to have more to say about this later on, uh, probably in another lesson. Horton also wrote, this expresses a hope which Paul entertained in reference to the gift that as yet, was not even made. He hoped it would reach beyond relieving the needs of the poor saints and cause all Jewish Christians to think well of, the, of their Gentile brethren in Christ. Whether it accomplishes this worthy object, we are never informed. This explains why the contribution is said to be unto them, the poor saints who actually receive the funds, and unto all Jewish Christians, in that the gift to the poor among them was also a gesture of goodwill towards all the Jewish saints. Now then, basically is what he is saying in this, to kind of give a summation of it is that Paul was collecting this money from the Jewish Gentile Christians. He was going to take it back to relieve help of Jewish Christians. In this, the Gentiles giving financial aid to the Jews, that it was the de desire of Paul to bring together the Jewish and the Gentile Christians. And so when he says, unto them... That's the poor saints in Jerusalem who actually are going to receive the money. And then all unto all has reference to Jewish Christians in general that would ha bring a, an endearing nature to the Gentiles by the gift that they had sent to the Jewish Christians. There's a question, though, since this is for those in Jerusalem, how does he know that the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, that there were some that were not poor? How does he know that there's other Christians, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, that are not poor? This was a famine that had taken place that affected everyone in that area, Jews and Gentiles alike. But yet, here unto them, those Jews in Jerusalem who were poor, and others, 
and all being those who are not poor, who are Jewish Christians. How does he know where they are? Where were they? In fact, if there were Jewish Christians in Jerusalem that were not poor at that time, then you might ask the question, why in the world was Paul collecting funds in all of these other places from Gentile Christians to send back to Jerusalem? Why didn't they do the exact same thing they did in Acts, the second chapter? Remember in Acts, the second chapter, there were those who had need. And there at Jerusalem... They met those needs in Jerusalem. In Acts, the fourth chapter, you have the same situation. You had poor, needy saints in Jerusalem, and brethren sold their goods who were at Jerusalem and gave to those and met the needs of those who were there. Now, if in this occurrence, at this time, there were some Jewish Christians who were not poor, then why weren't they meeting that need like they did the other occasions? Right there at home, you might say. It's a problem that does not have an answer if you hold this position. Then... There is another view that unto them has reference to Jewish Christians and unto all men, to all Christians. Jerry Fight wrote, The needy saints in Jerusalem thanked God for the fact that his people, even the Gentiles, were willing to give unto them, Jewish Christians, and if to them, certainly unto all Christians that make up the family of God. This explanation respects the fact that all is limited by context, does no violence to the expressed purpose for the collection, places emphasis upon the importance of the new relationship between Jewish and Gentile Christians as the gospel was spreading over the earth, and is consistent with other accounts indicating the collection for, from the churches went to help needy saints, not the whole world. Now then, the previous view by Wharton was that unto them was Jewish Christians <coughs> in Jerusalem, and unto all, <coughs> unto all men other Jewish Christians. Now then you have it just Jewish Christians and all Christians, whether Jew or Gentile, basically. Again, there is nothing in the context of 2 Corinthians 9 that limits unto all men in this way. It's just not there. And in fact, he argues the very point that he must prove. He is simply assuming the truthfulness of that which he is attempting to prove and then makes a statement in relationship to it. There's nothing in the passage that would indicate that the relief was for anyone other than those in Jerusalem. And thus, the all Christians idea is not within the limitations of that passage. But let's look at the passage itself. It's no question, brethren were in need. Those in Jerusalem were in need. And they were motivated, or this need motivated brethren 
in other places to contribute to their needs. We see a mention of it in Acts 11.29, then, <coughs> then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren which dwelt at Judea. So here's disciples in other places, according to their ability, determining to send relief to the brethren at Jerusalem. In Romans 15 and verse 26, it says, For it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So here's those of Macedonia and Achaia. That's the background of First and Second Corinthians and the appeal there. And in St. Corinthians, we see Macedonia being mentioned, and those of Macedonia being mentioned who gave money. Well, it was for the contribution of the poor saints at Jerusalem. And then St. Corinthians 9 and verse 1, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is sufflervious to me to write to you. And so here's the ministering to the saints. What is it? This poor, the poor at Jerusalem. Now then, the question becomes, did the saints in this practice of their Christianity render aid only, and that's the key point, render aid only to fellow saints? Or did they, as opportunities, resources, priorities occasioned, also give aid to the, anyone who had not obeyed the gospel. If you look at the context, <clears throat> in verse 11, he commends the Corinthians for their liberality, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. So here they are giving their liberality, and he's commending them for it. Then in verse 12, he mentions that it was meeting the needs of the saints. <clears throat> it's meeting the needs of the saints, and thus an offering of thanksgiving to God, when he says, For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, there's the needs of the poor saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto God. So it's causing thanksgiving to God as a result of it. Thus, when we come to verse 13, while it's by the experiment of administration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ. Here's those who are receiving the fund, thanking God for their liberality. For your liberal distribution unto them and unto all. The them obviously has reference to the saints. But again, what does unto all have reference to? Is it unto all saints? And thus, unto them and unto all saints? Or unto saints and unto all saints? You see the problem in trying to limit the word all here to only saints and no one else. But <clears throat> if you understand saints unto them and unto all being non-saints, then that harmonizes with what Paul told Felix in Acts 24 and verse 17. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. The alms there has reference to gifts that would be for the needy. He's dealing with this same thing that he's writing about in 2 Corinthians 9. That liberal distribution that was being made. Now, in Felix, he says, it was for my nation. 
And so unto them being saints, that's the primary ones that it was intended for, but as opportunity arose, it would, they would also help the nation unto all. And thus it makes a harmony between what Paul says to Felix and what we see in St. Corinthians 9 and verse 13. Several years ago, I uh, got into short correspondence dealing with this very subject because someone was questioning their views on it. And so I went through this and and the only thing that could be answered was, well, you only have one passage. That was it. And that was basically the end of the correspondence as well. How many passages do you need in reality? But that person admitted the truthfulness of it being unto them, saints, and unto those who are non-saints. And then tried to pass it off with only one passage. How many do you need? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and start the second passage. Not by any means going to get through with this one. But um, uh, Galatians 6 and verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Again, this passage seems rather clear and easy to understand in relationship to unto them who are of the household of faith, but then unto all men. So you have unto all men, but in particular those who are of the household of faith, those who are saints. There are some, and I've just, I only know really one individual who has argued such. I don't know if others hold this position. That... Galatians 6.10 has absolutely nothing to do with benevolence. Ricky Jenkins wrote, But a close examination of the passage shows that it is neither authorizing congregational action nor speaking of benevolence. And so the doing good in Galatians 6.10 according to this view, and we'll get to the aspect of congregational action in a minute, and they'll go into next week, Lord willing. But the aspect here of that it is not speaking of benevolence. And yet, that is the background of the book of Galatians as well. That collection for the saints in Jerusalem. But then all of a sudden, it's not talking about benevolence. There are brethren who believe that the doing good that is mentioned here has specific reference to the benevolent work for Jerusalem. I would say... It certainly includes the benevolent action for the poor saints in Jerusalem, but is not limited to that benevolent action. But now then, looking at that other aspect, that it is only individual action. Brian Yeager wrote, Many make an appeal to Galatians 6.10 in an attempt to argue that a local church can supply from her treasury things such as money, food, clothing, housing, etc. to saint and sinner alike. 
Many believe that since the book of Galatians was written to the churches of Galatia, Galatians 1, 2, this means collective provision to saint and sinner alike can be done from the treasury of the local church. He says, I am writing to refute these absurd claims. And I am suggesting to anyone reading this article that brethren who appeal to Galatians 6.10 are doing so to justify their actions, not authorize their actions. Another one, Ethan Longhenry, concludes, Therefore, as we can see, the individual Christian is the focus of this portion of, Galatian, of the Galatian letter. It stands to reason that verse 10 thus also refers to the work of the individual and not the work of the church. And so the real question becomes, is this only individual action? Now understand that their argument is not simply that it is individual action that's under consideration. But their argument, as we noted from the debate propositions, is that it is sinful for the church to do it. Because it is only individual action. And if the church engages in it, then it is sinful. But their context causes them a little bit of a problem. Go back to the context, starting in chapter 6 and verse 1. And Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The question then is, because according to verse 10, their position is that it is sinful for the church to engage in those activities. Is it sinful for the church as a collective body to restore those overtaken in a fault? If this is individual action only, and it is sinful for the church as a collective body to do it, then it is sinful for the church to restore a brother who's been overtaken in a fall. Now, who's to believe that? But let's go on. In verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Again, individual action is what the pro proclamation is. Individual action only. And it is sinful for the church to engage in these things. Therefore, is it sinful for the church as a collective body to bear one another's burdens, to bear people's burdens? But also in this same verse, there's that statement, and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is, it's being argued, this is individual action only, and if the church does it, it's engaged in sin, thus is it sinful for the church as a collective body to fulfill the law of Christ? Now they want to talk about context being individual action only, and it does not authorize the church to do it, and thus it's sinful for the church to engage in it. Therefore, it is sinful for the church to fulfill the law of Christ. Who can believe such? But let's go on. Verse 4. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing of himself alone and not in another. Individual action. Sinful for the church to engage in it. Is it sinful for the church as a collective body to prove its work? I have to say it 
if it is only individual action and it's sinful for the church to engage in it, then it has to be sinful for the church to prove its own work. Verse 5, every man shall bear his own burden. Is it sinful for the church as a collective body to fulfill its own responsibilities? And the word burden there has reference to personal responsibilities or one's own responsibilities. So is it sinful for the church as a collective body to fulfill its responsibilities? They've got to affirm that it is. In verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Here he is, the church or individuals sharing financially in the teaching of the gospel. Is it sinful for the church as a collective body, the church as the church, to share financially in the teaching of the gospel? I have a big problem if uh, we hold that position. And we'll come back to that a little bit more, probably, Lord willing, next week. But verse 9 then, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now then, is it sinful for the church as a collective body to continue in well-doing? It has to be if it is sinful for the church to do good unto all men, especially them of the household of faith. Of course, they do argue it is sinful for the church as a collective body to do good unto all men, and especially those of the household of faith. Verse 10. Because that's their position. It is sinful for the church to do this. Of course, you have a problem in the latter part of that verse. Would it not be sinful for the church to do good, the church as a collective body, to go, do good unto the household of faith? Now then, they admit they can't, you really can't get away from doing good unto all, especially those of the household of faith. Well, if it applies to the all, who would be include non-saints, and in particular the household of faith, those are saints. If it's sinful for the church to do good unto all men, including non-saints, then it would also have to be sinful for the church to do good to those who are saints. What must be argued, well, what must be argued is that it is sinful for the church as a collective body to engage in any of these things that we've mentioned in verses 1 through 10. The truth of it is that it include, it's dealing with individual action, but it also in, is inclusive of a collective action. And we'll look at some of the implications of this in Galatians 6 and verse 10, uh, Lord willing, next week and continue at this point. But there is that preaching and that teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we looked at verse 6 and how that we as a collective body share in the teaching of the gospel of Christ. We individually share in the, gospel, in the teaching of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is that which is able to save our souls. It should be our desire to get to heaven. But not only ours, but, to, but all individuals. And thus, there's that teaching of the gospel of Christ. If you're not a Christian, then what you need to do is obey the gospel. If you're not lived 
if you have not lived in such a way that God would be pleased with you, repent and come back into him. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. Why? Because heaven is too precious to miss. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation.